Welcome to our review of The Ghosts Betwixt, a modern dungeon crawler set in America's haunted heartland. Thank you, Innocent Traveler Games, for sending us a copy of this game to check out. So The Ghost Betwixt is the first game from Dustin Freund and his company, Innocent Traveler Games. It was first published in 2021 after a successful Kickstarter. It features artwork from Travis Hansen and Cole Munro Chitty. Now, this is a one to four player campaign based dungeon crawler with individual games that can take an entire game night to finish. Some of our games lasting over five hours. You can pick up the Ghosts Betwixt just in time for Halloween direct from Innocent Traveler Games for $60 USD plus shipping, which I've got to say isn't a bad price at all, considering all the stuff you get and the length of the main, cam main campaign. So the Ghost Betwixt is a modern dungeon crawling board game where your family of five is investigating a horror theme park that's long shut down in search of one of the kids who's been kidnapped by someone on the grounds. You do this by th playing through a multi-episode campaign where each section features randomly determined elements like room placement and position and what's in each room, making each playthrough totally unique. Game features a mix of exploration and dice pool based combat with your characters leveling up, learning and improving their skills and talents and finding new gear. Now, despite its somewhat Saturday morning cartoon look, this is actually a meaty dungeon crawler approaching the complexity level of heavier dungeon crawlers like Gloomhaven. Now, for a look at all the stuff you get in the box, including a ton of cardboard and custom dice, check out our Ghosts Betwixt unboxing video on YouTube. Now, there's a lot in this box, and I don't think it's worth going through bit by bit here on our podcast. So instead, I'm just going to highlight a few things that stuck out. Now, the game features three different books that you'll be swapping between a lot during play. One is meant to be a learn to play book. The next is a reference book, and the last is the adventure book. Sadly, these are not the best written books out there, but more about that when we get to our thoughts on the game. The room tiles and counters are nice and thick and two-sided. The custom dice are easy to distinguish and read, though I do wish there were more of them, as halfway through the adventure, we're now having to re-roll dice often. The various cards in the game are of good quality and finish and have held up to a lot of shuffling. So one thing you won't find here that many people expect from a dungeon crawling board game are minis. Yeah. What you get instead are a number of cardboard standees and stands to hold them and stickers to put on some of those stands to differentiate multiples of the same monster type. Now, overall, the component quality is good to excellent, with the biggest problem actually being figuring out how to organize all the stuff. Due to how long it's going to take the average group to get through just one campaign of the Ghost Betwixt and the possibility you may replay it, I think most groups are going to want to invest in some form of third-party organizer for this game. In this case, baggies just don't cut it. There are too many different tokens, cards, standees, and bits to keep track of. Yeah, they really don't. Right now, my copy is a mix of baggies and a single plano box, and I wish I'd done more. This is one of those games that because of this, I now try to set up before people get to my house so that we can start playing right away. And we'll often leave set up until after they leave just to clean up on my own. So we don't need to eat into that precious gameplay time. Now, before we move on, I want to point out that during this review, I am going to be mentioning some things going forward that some people might consider spoilers. Now, the thing is, I don't think these things should be spoilers. And I'm going to be totally sure not to spoil any of the story or the big surprises. There are some things, though, that the designers chose to keep from beginning players that I wish I had known going in. Due to that, I'm going to call these things out for anyone who's considering picking up the game because I think they will impact whether this will be a right game for your group or not. Well, with that warning in place, let's move on to an overview of play. So the Ghost Betwixt is a campaign based dungeon crawler that's meant to be played in a linear faction, at least up to chapter four. Each main chapter is meant to be played once, though can be replayed if you fail. Eventually, you'll unlock scavenger hunt missions. These are different in that you're expected to play them multiple times, and they can be played in any order and even between later missions. 
Now, as a campaign game, everything you earn in one mission does carry over to the next. That said, this game is replayable. Due to the amount of randomly determined things during each chapter, each time you play through an individual mission, it will play differently from the last. This not only makes the game stay engaging when you die, but it also means the same group of players could play through it multiple times, and it would be a unique experience each time, or at least the action would be. The yeah. story, not so much. Now, once you've decided which mission, which mission you're playing, and again, they go in a logical order, there's quite a bit of setup to do. This involves gathering the proper room tiles, gathering the right monster standees, gathering the monster cards for the appropriate monsters, and other components used in that mission. Now, a big part of this is making what they call token piles, which is what's used to randomly determine what's in each room and the order the rooms come up. Now, individual missions may also have additional setup rules you have to follow as well. Now, there is a lot to track in this game, and mm -hmm. they've given you all the pieces to do that, but it means that there's a lot of usually small things on that table. Yes. Now, each mission starts with four family members start up, set up on a starting tile with the first objective card for that mission revealed. This card will tell you what you need to do to complete it and progress the mission to the next stage. Now, most missions start with what the game calls the exploration phase. Here, you're moving around the map, opening doors, and while exploring. Now, what's brilliant here, and this is something I would love to see carried over in other dungeon crawlers, is there's no initiative, there's no turn order, and you don't even count spaces square by square. You just move your standees to where you want to be and do a thing, like search the room or open a door. Searching rooms is done by making a test. These are done by rolling a number of d6 based on one of your family member's total focus points and looking for the sixes. The most sixes, the better. What you find is determined by the room type and the mission. Now, opening doors is actually a new phase. So once everyone's lined up at a door, you go, I open a door, you now switch to a different mode of play, I guess, or another subsystem. Here, you're going to flip over the random room number token assigned to that door, which will tell you what room to place there. You're then going to flip over three exploration counters to determine what's in that room. Now, these counters can include monsters, traps, vending machines, story points, more doors, and a ton of other stuff. All coming from those tokens you set up at the beginning of the mission. Again, more tokens, more fiddly. Now, yes. I think it's worth it because of the variety and flexibility of the game. But there is, I can't state enough, a lot to manage here, which mm -hmm. I feel like I'm going to say a lot during this review. <laughs> now, here's an interesting bit. You've got your new room. You've showed your tokens. If you don't draw enough doors to cover all the exits from this room you've drawn, you continue for one more room. Drawing another room number, drawing another three tokens from that room and spawning everything, which can actually lead to some really interesting map layouts. And more importantly, really neat sprawling fights over multiple rooms. This is something else I have not seen in any other dungeon crawler. But be warned, this game can be a table hog. Yeah. A 4x4 four four table isn't enough to handle a four-player game of this between the map and player boards and cards and tokens. Yeah, not easily. You can, you can make it work, um, and depending on the way the room spread, you can probably try to keep things condensed. But yeah. It can take a lot of table. Now you continue exploring like this and opening doors until you reveal a room with monsters in it by drawing one or more monster tokens. Now what's neat on these is these are also randomized and they're numbered. And each number represents a different set of baddies determined by the mission. You then spawn the baddies into the room with their token or in the room with the family if you also drew an ambush token and combat begins. And this is where the game hits its stride. So combat switches play to a more traditional turn-based board game feel, with one family member acting, then one group of baddies, then another family member, another group, and so on. Each family member's turn, they can do two things, which most, both must be different. These include moving, swapping equipment, using items, taking a defensive or offensive stance, attacking using a family member's unique talent, or taking mission-specific actions, which of course are going to change depending on what your objective and goals are. Now, enemies move based on a simple AI that uses a very cool targeting system, 
where each monster picks a target based on drawing a random family member chip from a pile or a bag if you have the deluxe edition. Now, this basic system is the monster gets as close as they have to to attack, then does so. Now, many enemies also have what's called the hit and run ability, which will then have them back off. There are both rules for ranged melee attack types, and the ranged line of sight system is dead simple. But for all the management and complexity, the combat system is really quite simple and straightforward, and in mm -hmm. some ways, the shining star of this whole game. Now, actual combat rolls are made using custom dice, with these dice split into attack dice, defense dice, and damage dice. The dice pool you're rolling is made based on the family member's abilities and equipment, as well as the monster stat shown on their monster card. Now, some monsters will also get randomly generated abilities that will modify this pool. You then roll all of the dice, and you got a pretty basic, almost hero quest-like system of shields and dodges canceling out hits, where you're going to then total the leftover hits and compare them to the target's agility to see if you hit. For 90% of the monsters in this game and for all family members, you just need one hit to hit. Now, damage, though, is done separately based on a damage die, with the attacker then getting to spend any diamond symbols to set off special effects. You've seen this in many other dungeon crawling games with some special symbol that triggers powers, which are listed on all the cards. Um, you can do additional damage with this, elemental damage, shoving monsters, and all kinds of interesting special effects and status effects. That's it. One pretty straightforward die pool, and it's all resolved. Now, combat continues round after round until all enemies are defeated. The family then gets rewarded. In a very video gamey feel, you're going to pull cards from what's called the drop deck to see what drops you got. You're going to draw one card for every enemy token that you spawned and you're going to get XP. XP is awarded both for the entire family, equal to the XP of all the monsters in the fight, as well as giving bonus XP to the family members who dealt killing blows for each of the monsters. You literally take the monster off the map and put it on your character board, so at the end of the fight, it's easy to calculate what XP you get. Now, the drop deck contains all kinds of things, like items and equipment, money in the form of Bennert bucks, uh, books that teach weapon proficiencies, and more. Uh, one reward we want to specifically call out are monster trophies. Mm -hmm. When you get these, record the trophy number on the bottom right of the monster card somewhere. Note, you can have multiple copies of the same reward. So each time this card comes up, be sure to record all of your trophies. This isn't something that's clearly stated in the rulebook. Yeah, we messed this one up pretty bad. Realize that monster trophies are a currency you will get to spend later. After finishing off combat, the game swaps back to the exploration phase and play continues until you complete the objective on the first objective card. Once you do, we'll flip over, do what it says, and continue on. Most missions have at least four objectives you have to go to, and these are all over the place as to what they do are asking you to do. Common repeating objectives include revealing certain tokens when exploring, finishing set combats, and opening specific doors, but there's a whole lot more. Oh, yeah. Now, once you complete the final mission objective, you have complete, uh, completed that mission and get some big rewards, usually in the form of XP, based on how much health the entire family has left and draws from the rare equipment decks. After that, everyone earns XP and you can level up. Now, each party member has... 10 levels they can achieve while playing through the Ghost Betwixt, and each level requires more XP to reach. This is going to be really familiar for most RPG players, especially traditional RPGs. Now, the interesting thing here, though, is the XP is spent when achieving a new level. So when you level up, you actually spend your XP to get to that level. Now, at each level, you're going to unlock weapon proficiencies, which uh, quickly just give you rerolls, uh, talents, as well as the ability to level up existing talents. Talents are the asymmetric part of this game. They are unique abilities that differ for each family member. For example, Joan, the mom, is good at healing, and Maddox loves firecrackers. Now, at each talent level, though, when you go to, like, level two talents, you're going to get two to pick from. And because of this, there are some really neat ways to customize each character so they suit your play style. Plus, it gives you replayability, because you can play through a second time and go with a totally different build for each of the characters. So, of course... Uh... <laughs> Of course, the other way a scenario can end is a total party kill. 
if all family members get knocked down to zero health, the game ends immediately. Yep. Everyone gets to keep anything they found in the adventure so far, but they do lose half their Bennert bucks. They also lose any personal XP and bonus XP they gained, only getting the group family XP they'd earned up to the point before the final fight. Now that's honestly pretty high level. That, that, that is an overview of play. This is a complex, involved dungeon crawler with a lot going on. We didn't even touch on aspects like elemental damage or the four different kinds of traps or rare equipment decks or buying and selling items or the ridiculous number of different status effects, both positive or negative, or the fact facing matters when you're moving. But I think this gives you a pretty good overview of how the game plays. Just realize you're not looking at a light, silly, roll and move adventure game like HeroQuest. You're looking at something more on the level of Imperial Assault or Gloomhaven Jaws of the Lion. Now, with that overview done, it's time to move on to our thoughts on the Ghost Betwixt. So the biggest problem with this game, and I've kind of already hinted at this, is mixed expectations and missed expectations. Going back to when I agreed to review this game, up until we finished Scenario 4, we were still discovering things about this game we didn't expect, and not in a good surprise kind of way. The biggest shock to me, and what I think is going to be the most important thing people need to know when considering picking up the Ghost Betwix, is despite the Saturday morning cartoon look, this is not in any way a kid's game. Well, the game is clear about it. It says 14 plus on the box. The cartoony look and spooky but not scary looking theme makes it look like a kid's game. This is not a kid's game, both in rules complexity as well as content. Now, I wouldn't say this is an adult game. That's definitely not an 18 plus or rated R, but there are situations in the game that are better suited to playing with people, at least in their teens. Now, when I signed up to review this game, I expected to be playing a light hero quest style spooky horror romp with my kids. Instead, it turned into a Gloomhaven-esque campaign game that I play with Kat and Tori. It's really an art style issue. I hesitate to say, hesitate to say problem, but we have heard from others who had the same confusion we did. Mm -hmm. The colorful art on the box gives a different expectation from the rest of the information pre presented. Yes, the box does say it's for 14 plus, but how often have we seen that and and looked at the game and wondered why it was rated 18, 14 plus or mm -hmm. noted that it's only due to small components that it's rated 14 plus. Now, I don't have a solution, but I do think that it's a concern from a marketing standpoint mm -hmm. for this product. Now, the best big shock for me was how much of this game the designers chose to hide from you from the start. I just this confuses me. So one of the biggest being that this is not a six game campaign. Everything. When I looked into this game, when I read through it, when I looked at the mission box to me said six plays. When we review games, we try to play them at least five times. And I'm like, well, one more time, we'll play this six times and we'll finish the whole thing before I review it. That shouldn't be a problem. And then while we lose one, we'll play one more. Little did I know that in the middle of the campaign, I was going to unlock more missions. These are the scavenger hunt missions, the ones you can play multiple times. I thought those were totally optional. They're not. With these in the game, you are looking at a minimum of nine games to finish the mission. And trust me, there's a good chance you're going to be replaying a couple anyway, even if you just try to play each once. Now, again, that's not really a bad thing. Actually, nine missions is better than six when you're looking at replayability and value for money. But it's a fact I didn't know that I was in for nine missions when I signed up. This is one of those things that most groups are going to love. More playability. Mm -hmm. Yes, please. But combined with the unmatched expectation in what the game was, as mentioned before, it did make this tougher to review than expected. Yeah. Regular listeners know we give games their chance. We don't play a game once or twice and then give superficial opinions. But that got tough for this game. Yeah. Now, sticking with things I wish I knew going in, there are other things in this game that just were oddly obfuscated. For example, the monster trophy rules. I don't understand why they couldn't present these right in the beginning of the book. If they want to hide what they did, they just had to say, hey, if you draw one of these, note this number somewhere. Don't worry about it for now. And note, you can get it more than once. And then all they had to say is monster trophies are a currency you'll get to spend later. Just wait for it. Something like that. Like, why wasn't that in there? 
Instead, they tried to hide it like there was some cool surprise you were going to find later. Similarly, I think they they could have been way more clear about selling equipment. Like it's in the basic rules that you can sell for one third of the cost. That should have been mentioned that you won't be able to sell anything until you finish a specific mission and then be very clear when you can. Or even better, if you want to hide it, don't mention I could sell anything. If they had never mentioned selling, I wouldn't be questioning how do I sell until it came up. I just would have never known. I would have been like, oh, cool. I can now sell things. And I also would have liked to have seen, don't, you can't sell to a vending machine. Yes, I get it. That's not how vending machines work in reality, but I played enough games in my life that I can sell to vending machines, mostly video games, but trust me, Fallout, Borderlands, and many more, I've sold plenty of items to video games. I just, why did they hide this stuff? I, I find it frustrating. Yes, I realize there's slight spoilers here. Eventually, you get to sell stuff, but I don't think that's game-breaking, and I wish I had known when we sat down to play the first time. Unfortunately, the rulebook is filled with these kinds of ambiguities, and it really doesn't help that the rules are spread over three books. Mm -hmm. There are currently 40 threads in the rules section Board Game Geek filled with rules questions on the Ghost Betwixt. And I'm sorry, but the designer stepping in and saying the rule is there, it's on page X, is great. But it shows how poorly organized things are by the number of times he's been required to step in and yeah. say, oh, but the rule is there on page X. Yeah, this game, uh, more so than many we played, could use a 2.0 version of all three books. Uh, personally, I think I'd combine the how to play book and the reference one into one or at least completely rewrite the onboarding book because it was terrible. It, and most of the book was referenced the other book. I, it, it, this was not a good way to learn the game. It basically took us just playing and fumbling and looking and Googling and board game geek surfing to be able to get through it all. And no, this is not a preview. We are not looking at a preview copy of the game. We are looking at the retail version of the game that you can buy in stores. So it's not just a the game wasn't done yet problem in this case. Feel like we're sounding a bit like a broken record here, but many of the Kickstarter games we receive that are not supported by an established publisher are suffering not from concept or gameplay or, or mechanics, but from rule books. Yeah. And this one is no different. What is a solid and detailed dungeon crawler with character growth and intriguing map development and a fantastic combat system is hobbled by not one, but three books which confuse and leave the players unsure if they've made a mistake or if the rules are wrong or if they've missed something. Now, one more negative before we do give the Ghost Betwixt some redemption here. My final complaint, which again is an issue of mixed expectation, is the gameplay time. While our initial plays were long, like, like way over the two-hour time limit on the box, they did include a lot of time referencing rules and searching Board Game Geek and trying to figure things out. So I didn't complain about it too much but the thing is even once we got the rules down and everyone knew what they were doing our games of the ghost Betwix were taking over four hours regular now i don't mind spending four hours on a single game but to me that's a different type of game that i want for a different type of game night now the ghost Betwix has become a, a, a lifestyle game an event game it's the game we play we get together and we play ghost Betwix. Heck, our last game, we even tried to play quickly. We're like, you know what? I want to do the review. I want it live before Halloween. Let's sit down and see if we can hammer through two. And we tried to play fast and it just didn't work. Now, the biggest problem is, yes, the combat is fantastic. Yes, it's the biggest part of the game. It's the draw of the game. But man, the combats can drag on. And the problem there is a whiff fact. With most of the damage dice having a zero side, one of them having more than one, and the amount of defense dice both monsters and family members have, there are just a lot of rounds where the dice get rolled and nothing happened. This can make a single fight take well over an hour to finish. And so far, it seems to be getting worse as the campaign goes on, as defenses on both sides are going up. Now, this is a tough one, as again, much of it has to do with those incorrect expectations set mm. early on. Yet at the same time, Rulebook problems combined with the exploration and combat systems do stretch it out. Mm -hmm. It's hard to say if this is really a negative or not, and will really come down to your group and if they want to play a lifestyle game. Yeah, that, that like, yes, I just listed a ton of negatives, but like Sean just mentioned, 
most of these, actually pretty much all of them, except for that whiff factor in ambiguous rules, are a matter of mismatched expectations. They're not really bad things. And they wouldn't even be problems if I'd known about them ahead of time. If I knew I was signing up to play a heavy dungeon crawler that's going to be an epic game night experience every time we play, and it's going to take a minimum of nine games to finish, I probably wouldn't have complained at all. Okay, maybe a bit about the four-hour game length, but I definitely wouldn't have this many complaints as I have. Because the thing is, we've actually enjoyed our plays of the Ghost Be Twigs. This is a solid dungeon crawler with a unique theme. The story's been compelling. The system of exploring, opening doors, and combats actually works brilliantly. I have did enjoy the very predictable first end to scenario three reveal, which I think I, if any group surprised by that, I'd be shocked. But I liked the way that changed the game. And again, I don't want to spoil anything that way. I dig the new stuff we've unlocked, despite wishing it was kind of explained a little better earlier. And I admit, the one game that did lead to a TPK was frustrating. And that night, we weren't feeling all too happy about Ghost Betwixt. We were all back at it two weeks later and replaying the same mission. And I got to say, it felt interesting and different due to the exploration system and the randomization. Replaying that mission was actually quite fun. Now, I only played the first session, and it was marred by rule confusion. <laughs> but I still walked away feeling positive about the game, if not the rule books. Yeah. I was interested. I wanted to play it right. I wanted to play it more. I just wanted to be more clear about certain aspects. So this is a dungeon crawler that does some things right and better than others out on the market. The AI in this game is much simpler when compared to similar other complex dungeon crawlers. And I love the targeting system and the way monster attack cards make each individual monster in a group unique. Like you're fighting a set of wolves, but one has matted fur and another has has bad breath. And the last has a focused stare and that changes how they all play. That's really cool. And unlike other games, we've never once argued over the way a monster would move or what it would do. Which for anyone who's played through the Gloomhaven campaign, you know, <laughs> there's the fact you can go online and run the AI through a machine to see if you got it right. Heck, even at this point, I grew to love the facing system. And I'm like, what board game has a facing system for combat? But you know what? The joy of getting an additional or stepped up damage die when hitting someone from behind makes it worth those additional rules. Now, that said, the combat system is highly random and can be quite frustrating. If, if this is, really is the meat of the game. And it features the one thing I honestly hate in adventure games going all the way to RPGs. And that's when you roll a hit and it gets turned into a miss. I don't like games where I roll a success only for that to turn into a failure due to the results of other dice. Now, thankfully, this isn't an opposed roll system because I hate it even more in those where I see my result before seeing the other. But this happens often in the Ghost Be Twix. Now, I'm not talking about hits being canceled by shields, right? Like, I'm used to that. I, play, I grew up playing Hero Quest, and, and the dodge system's fine too. But it's the fact that I get a awesome hit on and then roll a zero on my damage die and do nothing. I could roll five hits with the enemy rolling blanks on all their defense. It's a perfect roll for my character, and it means nothing if that damage die has a zero on it. Like, honestly, this is the one rule we have talked the most about house ruling, that either you do a minimum one damage on a hit, or that you can spend additional successes for damage. Whether it's like you have to spend two for one damage or you have to double what you needed to hit to do damage, but something. But raw, these rolls are just another whiff and they aren't fun. Now, as someone who plays a lot of XCOM, I guess I'm more used to whiffing and the struggles of randomization in combat. Uh, it's the painful part for me is the way it extends the length of the game. Yes. Not the fact that the whiffs are there. Now, I gotta admit, if we do auto damage, the bad guys would be doing auto damage to us. Maybe the game would be too, too dangerous. I don't know. I don't know if there's a proper fix, but we've been thinking about it. So overall, the Ghost Betwix, for us, this isn't necessarily going to be for every group. Hopefully, if you've listened to this, you won't have the problems we had. And this has been a roller coaster. But a lot of that had to do with the fact we didn't know what we were in for. 
And a lot of that, honestly, is the game's fault and the designer's fault and the rule book's fault. But with the marketing for it and the way they hold back information on certain rules so as to keep them as surprises for later sets those wrong expectations. Really, the key with this game for anyone thinking of picking it up is knowing what you're in for. And that's why we're here right now. With the Ghost Betwix, you are signing up for a long campaign game, a game that's going to take at least nine sessions. And I'd, I'd be really surprised if someone won every mission the first time they played it. You're probably going to want to do more. Plus, there's the whole fact that you can grind the um, scavenger hunt missions. You may want to do that. That might be necessary to win the finer fights. We haven't gotten that far. Be well aware that those additional sessions are also going to be double the playtime of two hours listed on the box. Like, I don't know if the designer and their friends can hammer through this thing super quick, but for us, like, we are not slow AP prone players. This is a meaty involved dungeon crawler, but a good one. It's a game that had quite the learning curve, but that was worth fighting through to get to the end. Yes, it's involved a lot of Googling and checking board game geeks to get the rules down. But once we had them, they actually all work really well once you know what they are. This is an involved game with a lot of customization for your characters. And honestly, I would call it unprecedented replayability as far as dungeon crawlers go. Like without being a complete roguelike where everything's random. Replaying a mission in this, it will be different from the last time you played. Not just by swapping in and out characters, but by the actual physical layout of the map and what shows up when. Of all the dungeon crawlers I played, this is the one I'm honestly most likely to be willing to play through a second time. Either playing different family members or playing with different players. But also be aware that the Board Game Geek Forums will be your friend. Yes. Unless a second printing comes out or new rule books are added into the proposed chapter two for this game that is expected. Know that making sure you're playing right is not as easy as it should be. If you dig meaty campaign games that are going to challenge your group and take a long time to finish, you're going to want to check out the Ghost Betwix. Just realize what you're signing up for right from the start. And if you're the type of group who is happy to house rule things right away when it's not super clear, as opposed to the type who must play by the correct <laughs> rules, you might not even mind the rulebook issues. Now, I'll admit, when I'm reviewing a game, I want to play it by the raw, but I'll admit I'm just a raw gamer all the time, and I always want to know. If I'm, if I'm house rolling it, I want to at least know what the intended rules were first. Now, if you're looking for a light, fun dungeon crawler, something like a hero quest set in modern times, stay away. This is not the game for you and your group. The Ghost Betwixt is not a light game, has quite the learning curve, and is not easy. This is a game for experienced gamers who want a deep, tactical dungeon romp. Now, if you're looking for a silly, cartoony, horror-themed game, perhaps for a Halloween game night, Ghost Betwix is also not a good choice. Despite what it might look like based on the cover and the artwork, this is in no way a kid's game. And unless you've already unlocked the scavenger hunts, it doesn't even work as a one-shot themed game night experience. Nothing about this game is Saturday morning cartoonish. Well, that's it for our review of The Ghosts Betwix. If this seems like a game your group would enjoy, you still have time to order it now so you can start your game Halloween night. Now, in addition to this review, I also plan on writing up a written review of The Ghost Betwix, which you'll be able to find at tabletopbellhop.com once it's live. There, I plan in to get into a bit more detail about the game and how the various phases actually play and the actions you can take. And I'll also give you a better idea on if this game will be perfect for your group or if it's something you should stay away from. <laughs>